you know, um, for many years, you know, like, uh, and, you know, and you can see these people are discussing what's the meaning of life, you know, what's the meaning of life and how to get there. And like, and of course, everybody has all these different theories and the meaning of life is this, is that, you know, but, um, you know, meaning of life, um, I first came to, to understand it is not something to, to, it's not something to come up with to mentally as a proposition is something is something to feel you know um, in spanish uh, meaning of life is sentido de la vida sentido means sentir is to feel mm. so it's something that you feel or you don't feel and um, and it's basically um, the more the more connected we are to the energy of life mm. that kind of creative energy you know uh, the more life has meaning intrinsically so if you're really connected to that energy the very question that life has a meaning or not doesn't even arise in your consciousness because life is meaningful you feel it The central premise of transpersonal psychology is that mental health encompasses more than just the physical matter of the brain or the behavioral ailments attached to personality structures. The transpersonal approach addresses issues that arise from beyond the limitations of psychopathology. Before the birth of the field, it was only mystics and sages who grappled with transcendent or spiritual experiences. Transpersonal psychology may be one of the doorways for mainstream psychology to negotiate a more holistic approach towards mental health. Welcome back to the Soul Space Podcast. We are your hosts, Adrian and Thal. On this episode, we are joined by Jorge Ferrer. Jorge is considered one of the main architects of second wave transpersonal psychology, and he's best known for his participatory approach to spiritual knowing and religious pluralism. He is an international lecturer and professor at California Institute of Integral Studies. We explore non-ordinary states of consciousness, embodied spirituality or bodyfulness, plant medicines, and the need for more cross-pollination between spiritual traditions. Well, let's get into it. It is our pleasure to bring you Jorge Ferrer. Welcome to the show, Jorge. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Jorge, I think a great place for us to start this is to just hear a bit about your the spiritual orientation of your childhood. We want to hear some of your early experiences that put you on this path of transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think I can say a few things about that. Uh, um, you know, I was born in Barcelona uh, in 1968. So uh, I spent, uh, still is, but it was even more than a, a Christian Catholic country, and um, I did go to a Catholic school, uh, but uh, I think I was lucky enough uh, that the school was uh, was run by what um, Hermanos Maristas, like a brotherhood of educators, uh, that, and the object of devotion was not God the Father, it was the Virgin Mary. So in a way, they were like much less um, dogmatic and strict than, let's say, the Jesuits, for example, and the education was very good, but also there was something about that kind of... Uh, devotion to the Virgin Mary that I think kind of uh, uh, influenced my approach to spirituality from day one, like a more feminine, more organic in many ways. We'll talk later about it. I'm sure that this participatory spirituality could be seeing a much more feminine uh, uh, approach than, let's say, other more classical uh, transpersonal paradigms. And um, 
In addition to that, uh, what I would say is that also I went through um, kind of a number of kind of uh, non-ordinary um, states of consciousness and experiences uh, when I was a child. Uh, I think when I was like probably like 10, 11 years old in school, uh, several times I would go into what I learned, what I later learned to identify as a trance state. Uh, you know, in the Buddhist they call the jhanas, the, 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 the first absorptions, you know, in the, in the Theravada path and basically it was the spaces in which I would everything all, all the room around me um, everything around me would become completely blank I would have my eyes open uh, but I would lose completely contact less with the environmental uh, context and I would be in a space of like um, peace and light and, uh, and just beauty the teacher would wake me up and then I would start crying. Mm. And uh, after a few times, they took me to the school psychologist, uh, concerned that I could be epileptic. And uh, they ran some tests, and I uh, didn't find anything, and just let it go. And uh, so that was one experience. And then the other, uh, when I was a pre-adolescent, uh, um, I started having like uh, out-of-body experiences. And at first, I was very scared of them. And uh, they, I really didn't know what was going on, and I wasn't sure if I was going to come back to my body. So it was pretty scary. Scary. And uh, later throughout my life, um, uh, you know, I had them in different places and, you know, it, it became something else. But uh, at that point, I uh, was kind of like, uh, kind of like concerned. And uh, so those experiences, plus my, my sense, personal sense of some kind of like a, a neurotic uh, things that I was experiencing in adolescence and early adulthood uh, took me to the study of psychology. And uh, I was trying, like many people who go into psychology, I believe they they go to try to search for healing, personal healing, and also uh, understanding, in my case, understanding of those states. Of course, mainstream psychology at the university did not provide for either of those. <laughs> uh, those states were pathologized by uh, mainstream psychology as depersonalization or something thing being weird. Dissociation. Work, dissociation, uh, all sorts of stuff. And um, and of course, mainstream psychology did not provide any kind of healing for my neurotic loops. So I started like kind of uh, personal search for different paradigms that ultimately led me to find transpersonal psychology first through the books uh, and then also start meditation, like also practicing with some kind of psychedelic uh, substances and many, many other things and ultimately led me to see a Yes, uh, to study my PhD there and uh, when I finish, when I have to start teaching before finishing because I have to make a living and, uh, and I've been teaching there for the last 20 years. Mm. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> can I, can I actually, yeah, sure. yeah. I, I wanted to ask you um, about the out of body experience. I, when you said that my body kind of got a, a reaction to it. So I, I want to kind of press a little bit. Um, do you mind sharing what that first out of body was like? What was happening phenomenologically? Sure. Uh, basically, uh all of the out-of-body experiences I have had, uh, this very similar phenomenology to begin with, later they can change. Basically, one find is they normally happens, at least to me, when you're in that space in between uh, wakefulness and sleep, your mind is completely awake and lucid. So you are as awake as we are, the three of us right now, and most of our audience, I'm sure. Uh, and then um, at some point, like uh, you find your body completely paralyzed. So your body, you cannot move it, it's kind of paralyzed. And then kind of like an energy, you can hear it. It's like a, like a, zzz, like a zumbido energy, it's not like, like in waves. Until suddenly you find yourself out of the body. And uh, at first it could be extremely disorienting because uh, you have not learned, especially when you're like 12, 13 years old, to, to navigate or less even to understand those states. So it could be scary. You find yourself out there. You see your body in bed. You, 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 you know that you are in a kind of different body, like what is called the astral body, but you don't know how to, uh, how to make it work. So it could be very disorienting. So it took me many years, uh, and many out of body experiences through adulthood to, to actually like, uh, um, learn, uh, through experience to, to kind of like navigate those worlds much better. Hmm, amazing. Um, 
I think we're just going to move to the next question. Um, so one of your major contributions to transpersonal psychology is the participatory approach. Um, maybe if you can share with us how you arrived to, to that perspective, mm-hmm. personally and academically. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It's all intertwined. It's yes. all intertwined. Of course, uh, it's part, it was part of my personal process. It was part of my kind of intellectual uh, challenge and my spiritual unfolding uh, all at the same time. But what I would say is that uh, when I first arrived to uh, California in the early 90s and uh, a transpersonal psychology was kind of dominated by this kind of like a, what I call now neoperennialist approach, like uh, authors like Ken Wilber, like Stan Grof, people I really admired a lot and, uh, and have contributed tremendously to the field. They were like, I was like the fathers of the field and there was so much to learn from them and at the same time there was ways in which I felt uh, they were providing like this uh, kind of neutral language like uh, these categories that they were claimed to be transcultural for all spiritual paths or spiritual traditions but by doing so inadvertently in most cases especially in the case of Stan Grove, uh, the case of Wilbur is more <laughs> it's a different story I think they were kind of like uh, situating uh, the spiritual goals of some traditions above all others, either absolute consciousness or non-duality. And by doing that, they were like uh, relegating like the spiritual goals and uh, spiritual traditions that they didn't, did not share those goals. For example, most of Christian mysticism uh, does not share about non-duality, it's about cultivating the presence of God, uh, loving uh, God in your life, you know, not to speak about Taoism, you know, or um, indigenous traditions, you know. Uh, so different traditions, like theistic traditions, for example, were kind of relegated to a kind of a lower level of a spiritual insight and understanding. So that was in part part of my initial reaction to that. And at the same time, uh, I don't know, there was like a lot of kind of uh, very emphasis in the transpersonal psychology movement in that time about reaching a state of consciousness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like subconscious was the panacea, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, it, it, everything was focused. And p- people were still fascinated, you know, I mean, you need to understand like a uh, for many decades, like, uh, you know, spirituality in the States where, where, you know, the transpersonal movement was born had been dominated by very kind of uh, problematic forms of Christianity. Mm. So then uh, the, in the late 60s and mid 60s, you know, the psychedelics, the psychedelics came in and Eastern traditions and Eastern gurus came into the West, you know, and at the same time, um, there was a humanistic psychology speaking about big experiences and, and um, you know, far the risks of human human nature and I think the confluence of these three factors like give birth to a transpersonal movement with its, this emphasis in this kind of higher sense of consciousness and so most transpersonal psychologists of that time they were very busy mapping those states and they still are many of them and that's still a, a, a very valuable task but for me like the participatory movement like a, it's not a substitution of those of that first wave it's kind of an expansion it's like bringing all that down to earth mm-hmm. it's like what does in the in the in relationship mm. with other human beings, with societies, cultures, uh, diversity, and uh, the ecological crisis, our political situation, and so forth. So it's really about really like a democratization of spirituality, and also about like really affirming a plurality of spiritualities. Uh, there is no single uh, sequence of or paradigm model that is going to encompass all traditions in a way that is not ideological, uh, especially when you see situate them in an evolutionary continuum or developmental continuum, as all those transpersonal early psychologists were doing, you know. So the, the participatory movement is like a, emphasizes more like embodiment, you know, and also like a, um, relatedness, and also kind of like the, the inquiry, the creative inquiry dimensions of spirituality. It's not so much necessarily about rediscovering the truths that were already found by the old sages and teachers, but also, but also about co-creating your own spiritual path. Mm-hmm. I think it's, um, what you mentioned is very important because, I mean, personally, I found um, when I was going through my own 
crisis and asking all those questions and, and just the complexities of the world felt overwhelming. I found, um, solace in reading Ken Wilber and just, you know, everything hierarchical and organized and, and that has its place. But also, like you said, the participatory approach is not, um, to eclipse that, but to enrich the, that approach. Um, so it, yes. And in that way, can you speak more about how it can serve in our current global cl um, climate? Yes. <laughs> I think I lost your voice, but uh, I think I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I, do you want me to repeat the question? Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Yes. Um, I think I got the question. Okay. So, um, yes, I think just let me say something that I think you are totally right that uh, those early maps, you know, like uh, they were very helpful because at that point there was like this influx, influx of all these different spirituals and traditions and people weren't having these psychedelic states and uh, and it was almost this chaos, you know. So maps such as Ken Wilber's and uh, San Grove, they really put order to some extent to that. Like people say, oh, wow, now at least I have like a map that I can make sense of my experience. But of course, like a human experience, especially when you go beyond your own experience and you start uh, relating to many, many other people with different experiences, so it's much more complex and messy and interesting that any kind of conceptual map can 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 encompass. But anyway, coming back to your question, I think uh, I think it's I think it's very important like uh, you know our 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 situation like for example um, with the ecological crisis, you know uh, you know, you can um, you can try to persuade people about uh, being pro-environmentalists in many different ways, and many people are doing that. You know, because uh, they have an intellectual understanding of the problem. Other people are doing that because of survival reasons. You know, because and that's very important, uh, not only for themselves but for their progeny. You know, they really want to make sure that their grandsons and granddaughters have still a, a, a wall in which these trees, <laughs> for example, and this air that can be breathed. <laughs> okay. And and uh, or still others can do it for a variety of reasons. But um, I think like uh, what um, participatory, but also, you know, other approaches like eco-psychological and transpersonal ecology like bring forth is, is, uh, is more important because take, for example, the emphasis of embodiment. When the, the more embodied you are, you know, the body is really part of nature. It's so part of nature in a way that uh, the isolated mind can be more dissociated from with. So um, the more embodied you are, uh, the the more naturally empathic you are to the pain and uh, joy of nature. So therefore, it uh, becomes something more an existential imperative. It's not so much like that you're doing this for the survival of, of, of your granddaughters or because you know it's right. It's because you care in the flesh of your body that that is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorge, I'd, I'd love to ask you um, personal practices that have helped you, um, become more embodied. So, you know, I, I love that we're bringing this up because I feel like that is, th that seems to be a very relevant thing within today's, uh, uh, spiritual climate uh, embodiment, that word comes up a lot, but the practices I feel are, are helpful. If we, if we go into that a little bit to share with our listeners. Yes, this is a great question. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I spent uh, almost 15 years of my life in the Buddhist tradition, uh, meditating, and uh, at some point I quit. <laughs> it's not that may, I value meditation and I incorporated many aspects of it in my everyday life, and I still meditate sometimes. But at some point, uh, as some even like Buddhist teachers today, like uh, Reginald Ray and many others, have brought these critiques of meditation as a potentially disembodied practice. And uh, mm. of course, all depends how you meditate, right? But uh, there is a way in which people can really spend a lot of time in their minds and consciousness. And uh, and of course, in many of the traditions, like uh, meditation, I'm thinking about Buddhist, you know, originally was also about like really, you know, the body was something to really be left behind, you know, not to speak about sexuality. <laughs> and uh, and it was about really cultivating the more subtle dimensions of the heart and the sense of consciousness, you know. And of course, in India, in the Indian matrix, liberation was understood as something to escape samsara, to escape the body, to escape this phenomenal natural reality but it doesn't leave you many resources for environmentalism, but that's a different issue. <laughs> um, so for me, after many years of that practice, I was at the same time uh, already experimenting with like uh, secret uh, plant teachers and um, ayahuasca and mushrooms, and in particular San Pedro, that is my main plant teacher. And San Pedro in particular brought this very strong dimension of embodiment because San Pedro doesn't, it's not a, it's not a plant that takes you to this kind of like uh, inner journey, 
different walls, spaces, and subtle walls that could be very fascinated, uh, fascinating and very interesting and important. Uh, but it's a plan that teaches you to how to be more embodied here and now. Um, from being here and now, you open the... To, so to speak, like the, the windows and the doors of your home, mm. of your body, to all those other realities, but without leaving home, so to speak. And uh, also um, another practice that was very influential to me was like um, um, interactive embodied meditations. Uh, it comes from a work called Holistic Transformation that, that I used to uh, co-facilitate in Esalen Institute and in other places. And uh, it's basically a, a word that um, people come together and they practice this meditation uh, uh, in, in relationship with each other and in physical contact with each other. So it's a way in which you bring kind of like the mindfulness practice into physical contact to the body. And I think that's very powerful. My sense, uh, there are many works now that uh, are very cutting edge. And I think that my sense that the, the most cutting edge works are those that integrate somatics, the body, and the spiritual consciousness, mindfulness. And, uh, you know, uh, in the last, only the last couple of years, a few books came out about uh, bodyfulness, you know, that is a term that I actually coined myself in 2006 uh, to speak about not so much mindfulness of the body, but about the kind of awareness that kind of emerges from the body itself. Mm. Like, it might be like, you know, the big cats of the jungle, you know, they, they, they are not intentionally trying to be alert, but they are extremely alert, much more than human beings. Mm. I can't say much more, but maybe I'll leave it here so we can can go wherever you want me to go. <laughs> Actually, uh, that's something that we can explore further. I mean, just comparing um, the word mindfulness to bodyfulness is is interesting because mindfulness can be a way where people become even stuck more in their mind and forget their body. And, yeah. and you know, and then I'm thinking about the term spiritual bypass and how, you know, instead of using spirituality to become more integrated and aware, we can use it to just escape our our. our our body, our humanity. So if, if you can speak more about that, for sure. That would, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, in terms of mindfulness, of course, there is like, a, you know, the, the mindfulness that has become popularized today in the States and in Europe is a more cognitive approach to mindfulness that is quite mental. And uh, that's not even necessarily the mindfulness, excuse me, Oops. Not necessarily the mindfulness that was cultivated in uh, Buddhism uh, in other traditions uh, has many differences, as many many Buddhist scholars have pointed out today. But um, but in any case, um, um, in terms of the spiritual bypass, uh, just so I'll just explain, just uh, in case the audience don't know what this term means. Spiritual bypass means, in particular, when when one kind of like uh, uh, goes into spiritual practice or teachings, and uh, in order to to, uh, to avoid facing psychological issues. I'll give a couple of examples. For example, someone who has a lot of issues about anger, um, you know, anger towards their parents, anger towards the world, whatever, you know, they can very feel, feel very drawn to practice Buddhism because, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, they emphasize the no expression of anger at any moment and also the equanimity and like being super, super, super peaceful all the time, you know. Or someone, for example, that has like a sexual blood or issues around their sexuality, they can become drawn to a tradition that emphasizes celibacy. Is that a solution? I don't think so. Uh, in the best cases, they can transform some of those energies in positive ways, and that can happen as well. But uh, I think our path really do the psychological work, the psychosomatic, psychoanalytic work to heal those sexual blocks, to, to really clean your, uh, the, the anger within yourself and to forgive your parents or forgive the world or whatever you are angry against. And then from, from that solid foundation, like build your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So definitely the psychological growth and the spiritual growth go in tandem. We can't separate both. That's a mistake that I've done in my life. So <laughs> learning slowly. Um, Another, another, um, uh, um, if I may say, if I, say, if I may sure. yes, interject uh, just a second. I mean, ideally they should go in tandem, but m many times they don't, right? And uh, and we see this all the time, and, uh, you know, with for example spiritual teachers, you know, that uh, they're they awake or they have certain awakening, for example, in their consciousness and even in their hearts. But um, you know, they get into all sorts of sexual scandals, right? right? Yeah. And, uh, and they and, and ethic, unethical behavior and, and power gains, right? So um, this is really 
speaks to uh, to the fact that uh, although they should go in tandem, ideally, they, they very often they do not. Yeah. So you have people who have like, you know, like I know many shamans who, who are masters of the psychic realm and they can be tremendously gifted healers. They're real shamans. Mm-hmm. Let me be wrong. This is very important. They're real shamans. They're elders in their communities. And at the same time, they, you know, they, they have start doing ceremonies with uh, Western women, but they also have transference towards them, and they also make this like a, it could be a mutual way, street dirt energetic, but they still, and then they lose their, they lose their papers, you know, they start kind of like, a, um, you know, um, sexually harassing them, or in the worst case scenario, abusing them, or using their power, you know, so this is very unfortunate, and that is what is so important uh, that we affirm and we encourage this kind of integrated spiritual growth that includes uh, uh, not only just the heart and consciousness, but the body and sexuality in particular. Uh, it's not the same uh, to become mature mentally or emotionally than to become mature sexually and, and, and somatically and so forth. I I love that. I, I, I want to ask you, um, I'm just thinking if someone's earnestly trying to develop spiritually, they're in, involving in practices, learning from different you know people, reading books, what are some helpful signs that they might be on a disintegrated path, right? So what might that look like? Um, because we're all vulnerable to it. I don't want to sit here pretending like, you know, that we can just talk about these things as if we're outside of it. You know, I think we're the first to, to admit that we are all susceptible to disintegration or disembodiment. What does that look like? What and, are some telltale signs? And and the work never ends, really. Like it, it's constant, and it's it's something that we were talking about too before starting the podcast with you. Is that the the I'm thinking about the Jungian concept of the shadow, and it's like the more the more you work on your spirituality, your light, quote unquote, then you're you still have to be aware of your shadow and, and the dark, quote unquote. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, I, I have a um, um, qualification around that because, you know, that is, uh, you know, as the saying goes, you know, the greater the light, the greater the shadow. Yeah. I don't totally believe that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's the case only in those cases in which the development has not been integrated. In the development, it has been a lot of sec- 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 spiritual development, a lot of light and consciousness, mm-hmm. but there has not been like a deep psychological war going together. If a person is developing spiritually and also has uh, been doing a lot of depth psychological work. I don't think that the greater the light, the greater the shadow, uh, even though it's kind of a nice saying that makes kind of intuitive sense uh, because, you know, uh, light and shadow go together. In, it's in a our, clean uh, box, Jorge. <laughs> Why break it open? <laughs> <laughs> But unfortunately, unfortunately, in many cases, that's the case. But that's, I think, right. that's a sign of this kind of more, more dissociated, uh, dissociated forms of spiritual thing, which people are just developing in some areas and not in others. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of related um, since we brought up altered states. Uh, this is something that we're experiencing right now um, today is the, the renaissance of psychedelics, um, both in research as well as just exploration, you know, more and more people that, that are turning towards these uh, tools. Yes. What, what, what excites you about this renaissance and, and maybe perhaps also what worries you at the same time um, with this current trend? Yes, many things are exciting and many things, and many things are disturbing or concerning. <laughs> Yes, I think um, um, I think I think there's two levels, uh, two parts of this question. One is on the individual level, on for people who are experimenting, and then uh, some on the more cultural level. I think there's two two sides of the question. So on individual level, I think. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a watchmaker, I'm a scientist, so I, I do believe in the transformative power of many of these plant medicines. On the other hand, I think there is a lot of uh, caution to to, um, to approach them with caution is very important. I think um, you know we all know people who have done a lot of psychedelic work, and uh, and you know their egos are not smaller, they are bigger, you know, and sometimes they have really weird ideas, you know, and conspiracy, they become conspiracy, conspiracy theories, and sometimes they're, you know, they're they not becoming better persons, you know, so what's going on, right? So I think it's a mix of um, several factors. One is uh, the baseline of the person, the kind of character, if like someone with a lot of uh, narcissistic wounding and uh, let's say a borderline personality or other things, starting the psychedelics, you know, 
without doing the psychological healing work that needs to do, more chances that uh, something can go wrong, more chances that it can become inflated or messianic. Or just, or just, you know, just not, not as good persons as they could be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and also, also is the factor of community and integration, right? Uh, when people, uh, indigenous people, do this, these plants, you know, there's a whole, uh, it's the jungle in some cases. Mm-hmm. There's nature around. There is a whole community and rites of passage, and there is a whole a social metric supporting that integration. And even in those cases, as we were saying before, that does not warrant that a shaman is going to be ethical or it's not going to be a sexual harasser, okay? So things are very delicate. And um, and also the community, I think the importance of community, and I'm not saying just a community, the community of peers, you know, the community of peers, the community of people who are going to tell you, uh, uh, frankly, if they're your good friends, they're going to tell you like, Jorge, you have been doing some better for all these years, but, uh, you know, I don't see you becoming more available to to, to life or to, to people. I, I think I see you even a bit more self-centered than you were before. I think that mirroring is crucial. And uh, if it's just one person telling you, yeah, but if it's like a community telling you, that's really powerful. <laughs> so the power of community is very, very crucial. On a cultural, social level, um, the renaissance of psychedelic research, um, it's important and it's because it's kind of legitimizing and ultimately uh, it's going to help uh, in a few years, you know, it's going to become legal, um, you know, psychotherapeutic use of MDMA and probably psilocybin as well in the states of in Europe. So um, that's good because it's going to be able to uh, reach many people uh, that otherwise they were doing underground and in illegal ways. And many people, do, they, they wouldn't want to go that way. They would be able to access that healing. And of course, tremendous healing can take place and a lot of suffering can be kind of uh, eliminated or minimized. So that's really good. On the other hand, uh, there is like a lot of a plethora of like really challenging factors here. On the one hand is the big pharma. The other and it's like corporative interests are already like taking, uh, you know, trying to put their teeth in all this research. They are donating a lot of money for this research with no one believes that they don't want anything back. <laughs> um, so um, people who are in those organizations, especially MAPS and others, are very aware of these things. And at the same time, they are kind of, they're kind of like, um, you know, walking the race or age, <laughs> I would say. Um, and also um, there is the cultural dimension, you know, uh, of talk with uh, shamans and people from different cultures, you know, from the Mazateca or from that they have been using the Martians, for example, for many years. And, uh, and when they hear that, um, you know, the, you know, the establishment, the medical establishment is going to take that, that kind of like sacrament from their plants, psychosalivine and medicalize it and, and just sell it and, and everything. Uh, and there is not much um, even uh, credit or honoring of the tradition or all the wisdom that they have. Of course, they are not very happy. And I think with some good reasons. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, you know, you're just talking about that. I'm thinking you're talking about the plant teachers and I'm wondering how, how can we, or, or I don't know, I don't know how to put the question, but I'm thinking we bring the plant teachers. If we, if we bring the plant teachers here, can we still have that, the, the sacred, that element of the sacred? Are, are we also appropriating yet another, indigenous method of healing i mean uh, what are your ideas around that yes well um you know i do work with uh, plant medicine uh, after spending 12 years uh, right. going through and uh, kind of belongs to a kind of a lineage there so uh, it was passed to me but at the same time i'm not a native i'm not a mestizo i'm not a peruvian uh, of course san pedro is different because there is not like such a long tradition as passions so even with with Shpiro, although um, even those traditions are less. Um, Sorry, Jorge, you know, we lost you. Sorry, yes. we, we lost you for a minute when you said something important about San Pedro. Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, with San Pedro in particular, it's not such a. Um, the tradition is lost, right. uh, so it's not. It's like a whole list of tradition. It's, it's more disseminated, but with other plantations, it's different. I think it's a very delicate thing because, mm-hmm. on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a big. Uh, 
Um, you know, I would love uh, as many people as possible in the world to benefit from those teachers. I believe those the plant teachers themselves, the, the plants, the intelligence of the plants, they want also that. They mm-hmm. want to give and they don't care if they're giving to, to the natives or to Westerns. They want to just give to everybody because they are like a, um, in sentient intelligences um, uh, from, from Earth, you know. So um, they want just to benefit all sentient beings. On the other hand, there is so the, 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 the perpetual issue of colonialism, right? When when a culture has been colonized, when when their women have been raped, uh, where, where their lands have been taken off where, by the Western people, you know, and then now they are taking their sacred masons, mm. that's, that's, of course, is going to be always like an area, contested area, and with a lot of understanding. I think like the, in the basic scenarios, and it's happening sometimes, but not always, um, some kind of like a, a dialogue with with the people from those traditions could and should take place. The case should be given to them. Uh, some even compensation. Many of these people are just living in misery. So um, s- something that uh, they are also happy and then they will be also more willing to share their wisdom, you know. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, their willingness to share their wisdom, the way they use their plan is their own, uh, right? But I think the plan themselves, I think is their, their patrimony of all humankind. I don't think that any people have uh, you know, a sacrosanct uh, right to them and not others because yes, they happen to be born in that area of the world. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's my opinion. Or it's other people who think differently. That that is true. Yeah, I I actually agree with that opinion. I really think it's the fine line. It's like the middle way of of how can we these are plant teachers, gift from the earth. How can we um, bring that, but without um, appropriation, without you know, without the colonial baggage. It's 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 easier said exactly. than done, but yes, yes. absolutely. I, you, know, uh, uh, you know, as a Spaniard, um, uh, I, lived, I lived in the States for 23 years. I never had any issue when I saw American people cooking paella or mm-hmm. dancing flying. Mm-hmm. But American people never came to my country to destroy it mm-hmm. <laughs> and decimate it and rape the women of, of my ancestry and take our things, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that the question is, so the greater the history of colonialism, uh, the greater the issue and the more delicate the approach. And also the other, the other main factor is money. It's money. It's benefit. Mm-hmm. Who is benefiting from this, you know? Um, when, when you know, like a very bad, famous like group of music, I'll not say the name, like, uh, uh, took like some music from uh, indigenous people in Africa and they make millions and they never gave any coin to that to those people. That's a problem, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, those people who are living in misery and they took their music, they make billions out of it and they don't think anymore. So money, history of colonialism and, uh, and, and the way they are, is that a dialogue with those mm-hmm. people? I think that's our three factors that feel are very important. Yeah. I I also feel like I've heard you use this term and it's, it's actually a beautiful um, plant analogy is cross pollination, you know, perhaps as a more yes. harmonious way of seeing some of these practices and traditions being shared is the idea of cross pollination. Can you share what that looks like or your vision for, for this type of spirituality? Yes. Well, um, I used that word originally in the terms of kind of like a cross-pollinization of mystical and religious traditions. And I think that's what's happening today was I was using this word to in part to describe what's already happening with uh, the interreligious dialogue, like uh, different monks exchanging different practices and also teachings and so forth, you know. But um, at the same time, I also use that word like I saying, like, uh, I think this is really what we should be going because uh, its tradition is cultivating different human potentials. So some traditions are very good at meditation and cultivating the mind and consciousness. Or traditions are much better at cultivating harmonious relations with nature and seeing nature as sacred. Or traditions are much better at our charity and social action. So I think traditions have so much to learn and to teach. And the same thing, the same, the same way with uh, it can be applied uh, to our the context of our conversation. You know, with in indigenous traditions and Western traditions. I think there is in a way in which uh, uh, a lot of cultural exchanges in both bands, uh, both camps, they approach each other with certain pride. The Western people go there like, well, people are kind of like primitive, we can take 
mm. you know, the wisdom from them and their teachings because they are just using them in these limited ways and we can just use them in these amazing ways and reach many more people and we, we now know better what these plants are actually than even they know because we have analyzed them in our laboratories mm-hmm. <laughs> and so forth. But also there's the pride of the indigenous, you know, there's the pride of the indigenous that they say, you know, like, we know better, we are the spiritual people, you people are just completely non-spiritual and you don't know shit about what's going on with the plants. And in part, uh, they know much more than we do in terms of the spiritual use of those plants. But I think where the power and the possibility is in integration, in a dialogical approach in which both Western people, doctors, psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, come together with shamans, indigenous people who have been working with those plants, and they come together as equals, and they share knowledge. And not only they share knowledge, but also they, they really um, they inquire together. I think that's the future of that research that I would like to see. At least that's not what is happening in the big universities. Uh, it's uh, they come together and then let's journey together and let's do an experience together and then let's let's contrast our viewpoints. How do you understand what happened? And let's bring our different epistemologies, our different methodologies, our different mm-hmm. worldviews. And this is a kind of kind of multidimensional, um, multicultural dialogue mm-hmm. and inquiry and science that has not been has not been happening as yet. And I think that's I would like to see that happening more in the future. And and in a way that is the true work of of authentic scholarship really and when you say that the big universities are not doing that really it's sad because that that is the true work of of academics and 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 true scholarship is to exchange and to meet as equals um and you know I'm, I'm just thinking when you describe the, you know, the doctor of psychology meeting the shaman, both are, are trying to inquire about the spirit. It's just everybody's coming from a different perspective. Um, and, and speaking of, of, um, speaking, uh, talking about the same thing, but from different perspective, I'm thinking about mysticism and, yes. and I know you're, you're, you're a student of mysticism. Um, and the word itself, a lot of, modern minds might cringe when they hear that word. Um, what, what does, what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, it's a tricky question. Mm. (laughs) Um, you know what, for me, it means many things. Uh, that's why, because, um, you know, I'm a student of mysticism. I've been teaching mysticism, comparative mysticism for many years. So I know the history of the world. Uh, I know the, the different meanings the world took throughout the many centuries, coming from the Greek matrix through Christianity. Something to understand that is important, I think. And I'll, I'll go back to your question about what it means to me in a second. Mm-hmm. But something that's important to understand as a preface is that um, the term mysticism is a Western construct. It's a Western term. So it's a term that was later exported uh, um, by Western scholars, mm-hmm. Christian scholars, to understand other traditions um, that they were talking about spiritual access to spiritual entities or realms or realities mm-hmm. and, and so forth. But uh, for example, most Buddhist scholars would, would wouldn't, wouldn't like their traditions to be called a mystical tradition. Diti Suzuki, one of the most famous Buddhist scholars who popularized Buddhism in the West, was completely against the use of mysticism mm-hmm. to uh, qualify Buddhism. Uh, um, most indigenous people I know, they would say mysticism. Yeah. What is that? That's not what we do here. Yeah. <laughs> We're about healing, about balance, about something else, but not about nothing mystical here. <laughs> right, right. right. And, and so, this is, yeah. Okay. And th- yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, all that being said, what it means is that the term mystical uh, has many different meanings and uh, it's a contested category. And um, But in, in generally, uh, generally, generally speaking, what it meant, uh, it was talking about something about direct, direct contact, direct access to um, um, a reality and that uh, is beyond this natural world that uh, we normally see through our senses and science can study, or uh, a deeper dimension of this world that we can see, right? There is nature mysticism, for example, you know, and there's other forms of mysticism that more speak about, like, you know, uh, dimensions of consciousness or contact with the divine God in theistic traditions and, and so forth, you know. Um, so all that being said, like, for me, like, uh, um, uh, my, my personal thing uh, a kind of mysticism or the way I hold it is could be more about like a, 
kind of like an integral uh, experience uh, of life and the cosmos in all its multidimensionality. So not only this kind of dimension of uh, the natural world, but uh, different kind of subtle realms as well, and everything that is uh, encompassed by the world cosmos, you know, its depth and, and expansion. So kind of an integral experience of that, and different mystics and different traditions, they would they would access different dimensions of that, but also it's not a question of access only, it's a question of kind of creative enactment. So, um, and this is part also of the participatory paradigm, right? It's not only about like uh, accessing realities that already exist, mm. but they do, but also about co-creating with that kind of generative mystery, um, you know, and, and with, by the term mystery, what I mean is like that kind of uh, creative force, you know, that is behind the unfolding of creation, right? And uh, and I think that we we participate as human be- beings because we are part of that creation in that creative force. So in, in, in connection with that creative force, we can also kind of like co-create uh, spiritual uh, insights and practices and even perhaps new, new realities. Mm-hmm. And I think that what has been happening uh, from the from the beginning of the history of hum, humankind. And in a way, that's bringing it to the practical, right? Like even when we're talking about the plant teachers, they do take us into those quote unquote mystical um, experiences. But really, the the true work is after the ceremony, after the, you know, like it's not just to access those different realms, as you said, it's to bring it back into the everyday, the realm of the everyday. I I feel kind of, (laughs) I want to ask you a maybe not so practical question, uh, purely (laughs) just for my own curiosity. Um, It is there an, and I know you're not a fan of putting things into hierarchy. So I'm, I'm going to preface by asking, this is purely just for my, my own interest here. Um, is there a mystical experience that you're comfortable to share that really stands out as the most confusing thing that doesn't kind of fit, you know, a lot of, um, rational understanding, um, that maybe, maybe that is to me is, 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 is actually there is a practical element. It's sort of the, the humility <laughs> that, that brings, you know, that brings, it kind of brings you back, to, you know, to a place where you're like, I don't know. I don't know what the heck just happened. Is there something you can kind of share on that note? Yes, I'm sure. Yes. Well, um, my sense is that, um, I'll just say something like, my sense that the, you know, this is the paradox, the paradox of knowledge, you know, even, even the most uh, genuine scientists speak about that. The, the more, the more you know, the more you realize the little you know. So I would say uh, the more experiences, even mystical experiences, the more explorations you have in the realms of consciousness, the more you realize the, the infinite dimensions that exist there, like, uh, and the more you realize that the little that we know, uh, and the little that I know in particular, you know. So yes, I have many experiences that they were very, uh, they kind of like, uh, they constructed certain belief systems I have, for example, they, they, they had an impact on my theorizing, on my theories. I changed my mind many times uh, about certain things based on those experiences. For example, at some point, uh, I used to hold, I used to hold that, um, that, you know, many of the entities that uh, the traditions were speaking about, like from angels or bikinis or, you know, uh, sages that people would encounter, you know, they were somehow kind of mm, human, co-created by human consciousness in, in, in connection with that kind of spiritual power, you know, up to a point in which I have myself certain encounters with uh, uh, sages and also astral doctors and uh, mm-hmm. different kind of disembodied uh, entities made up of energy and consciousness that they really persuaded me um, that they were kind of uh, autonomous. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were so far much wiser than I was. <laughs> they were so far more, more benign and benevolent uh, uh, that even my deeper self, I'm sure it is. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and most importantly, uh, they have tangible effects on my experience. For example, I once encountered a, a Taoist sage, um, like um, I could see him in front of my face uh, and, um, and uh, from my back, he took, uh, he was bringing gifts and every time he would take this kind of like a gift, he would give it to me with his hand in my direction and I would experience a complete energetic uh, Shakti pump mm. transmission, you know. So it had like a tangible effect in like uh, in my embodied um, organism, you know, with astral doctors the same. I saw them with an ayahuasca experience in which uh, they were going moving throughout the room and they were healing people. They were putting their, their hands in their heart center and 
and vital center, like where the heart is. And when my turn arrived, when they put their hands there, they were like practicing like this extremely like uh, spiritual energetic surgery, like aligning the centers, like doing this very unbelievable. So you, you, I mean, you just feel like just want to cry and be just thankful to them. And uh, so anyway, I had like uh, some of these experiences that like really, um, kind of like may help me to to reframe my view on that you know and now i it's still a huge question you know my sense that there is a lot of things out there that could be ascended masters they could be they could be like some post-mortem scenarios and i don't believe there is just one post-mortem scenario i think there are many possibilities you know some people say well religious pluralism is very good it's very beautiful but once once you die you will see who is true mm -hmm. you know the heaven or the buddha land or i don't believe so mm -hmm. i think the post-mortem makes could be even much more complex and diverse than this one and people could go to different places but uh, but in any case like they could be like some people who are ascended masters people who have died and they are there working uh, uh, with us in different ways but also they could be our um, uh, independent realms mm -hmm. with their own kind of um, um, entities uh, made of energy and consciousness you know that uh, they're independently from these realms that they are not perhaps connected with humanity um, the only thing is like you know when you see like all the all the um, entities that the traditions uh, encounter like the kinis and angels you know they're very culturally shaped right uh, they're very culturally shaped so here there is also different interpretations you know some people say well um, it's because it's an archetypal manifestation that becomes cultural with the encounter but the essence is you know unknowable you know so the same entity would appear as an angel to a christian or as a buddhist teacher to another um, i'm not sure that that works mm -hmm. uh, because the qualities are very different uh, the energetic qualities the teachings are very different the messages are very different but um but who knows so there are many possibilities there's so much mystery there and it's very exciting that we are all all co-inquiring into all those dimensions these days mm, amazing thank you for sharing that i was transformed into another <laughs> realm listening to you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Jorge. Um, yeah. You, you mentioned at one point, just bringing together a group of people from all, um, the scientists, the Western minded, as well as the indigenous and, and co journeying. I think that really is to me is sticking as, as a nice final remark here is the idea that, um, perhaps we should all, you know, find opportunities mm -hmm. to co-journey with the other, you know, to step out of our comfort zones, our, our familiar tribes, and to really connect with the other, uh, to find maybe not common ground, but to find uh, the cross-pollination. What gifts do we, do we each have to exchange to one another? Um, and yes. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and of course, it goes without saying that doesn't mean that everybody needs to take a sacred plan or psychedelic. There are many ways to co-inquire and co-journey, right? Through meditation, through different practices together. But, but the importance that uh, exactly very diverse people from different traditions, different mm -hmm. worldviews, different cultures, different epistemologies, they come together and uh, do this kind of like uh, inquiry with humility yes. and uh, openness to learn to, from the other and really respect, I think is like the crucial challenge four times absolutely thank you or hey thank you so much for your time today thank you so much my, my pleasure thank you thank you very much thank you um you're you're gonna be at the conference right asilomar yes 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 you, uh, yeah i'm there? gonna be there too so i'll see Next you then time. yeah yeah and you and you adrian are you gonna be there unfortunately not so i'll be i'll be in oh. class i believe that weekend um but i i did want to share this with you so you, you just said something about Ascendant Masters and, and the mm -hmm. Taoist um, um, entity. So two weeks ago, I, 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 I was doing a primal exercise with my therapist, uh, breath primal induced. And I, I, had, I had a Taoist, I believe a Taoist entity um, come with a bag, arrive with a <laughs> stick and bag. And he traveled by cloud um, and he, he reached in and, and took out a gift, you know, it, it was a diamond. It was a, it was the brightest like diamond I've ever seen. And my body went into a reaction. So what, what you received there, I feel like this could be a common entity. Uh, this is, this is radical. I didn't want to bring it up in the podcast, yeah. but this is something special. That's great. Yeah. That's really great. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really appreciate that you share that because I haven't heard those uh, from other practitioners. You know, I'm very, um, it's funny because, you know, when, when that happened, you know, I, I had to study a bit of Taoism, but Taoism was never a tradition that I studied with any depth, you know. Mm. So at first, uh, because I had been studying Buddhism, I thought, oh, it must be like a Buddhist Lama. And then 
the iconography, books, Islam, Taoist, oh my God, that's the guy, you know, I could see like some, some like iconography of the Taoist states and it was completely with his back and, you know, his barb mm. and like Lama Bar is like, what? So it's like, why are Taoist states? <laughs> what a mystery, you know, but, but amazing that they also had like this back and the gifts. Mm. That's, 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 that's great. Well, yeah. Speaking of the, of the gift. Was many times. <laughs> May they return to us many times. Yes. 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 Um, speaking of like gifts, um, I, I did ayahuasca in Peru, and it was the most amazing experience for me as a as a you know as a Muslim woman, and the experiences that I've had. I mean, I saw I saw Christ on the cross, and you know, and I'm a Muslim, so like it's that's a different like message that I got. I also. Um, uh, you know, saw, um, the, the healer, the shaman that I was working with, like, just give me this band, uh, that has the Islamic declaration of faith and just for me to wear it, like to wear it on my head. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 and even like, even the people in the circle, we were sitting, like some of us sh- had s- shared visions. Like we saw similar messages, similar. I mean, I mean, I, I think, Definitely, the plant <laughs> teachers are definitely a way of bringing our hum- like I, I it's the way of the future. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. This program you mentioned that's about like um, something about meaning, like bringing meaning, and that's the goal. Or okay, yeah, right. yeah. When we first got together, we we had a hard time because we also don't want to to reduce it to one mission. But, you know, sure, sure. One, yeah. w- one way for us to get our message across is the meaning crisis to kind of refer it to as a, as a, as an overarching theme, you know, for all uh, our conversations. You know, because, because I read that, uh, has a, a thought that I, want, I wanted to share. Sure. I don't know if, we can if, include if, that later. Yeah. yeah. Later or not, you know, it's up to, totally up to you. No Absolutely. Sure about that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like, uh, there's something about, um, this kind of like crisis of meaning, right, uh, today, and uh, it's very pandemic, and we see this uh, very tragically in our in our youngsters, you know, especially in so many young kids, you know, that they have everything, you know, and like they still are meaningless, and they're like hurting themselves, and they commit suicide. There's something called the ungraying of mm-hmm. suicide. Uh, every time younger and younger people are killing themselves. Mm. So this is, this is huge. This is a great message for our culture, right? When our young people kill themselves because in a world in which they have access to everything, many of them are wealthy and they have, you know, whatever they want. So what's going on, right? So, um, you know, um, for many years, you know, like, uh, and you, know, and you can see these people are discussing what's the meaning of life, you know, what's the meaning of life and how to get there. And like, and of course, everybody has all these different theories and the meaning of life is this, is that, you know. But, um, you know, the meaning of life, um, I first came to, to understand it is not something to, to, it's not something to come up with to mentally as a proposition is something is something to feel you know um, in spanish uh, meaning of life is sentido de la vida sentido means sentir is to feel mm. so it's something that you feel or you don't feel and um, and it's basically um, the more the more connected we are to the energy of life mm. that kind of creative energy you know uh, the more life has meaning intrinsically so if you're really connected to that energy the very question that life has a meaning or not doesn't even arise in your consciousness because life is meaningful you feel it <laughs> but uh, whenever the question arises of consciousness is symptomatic in my opinion that um, there is a greater connection with that energy of life that you can explore and you can explore that of course I'm blocking the body from shame, for example, from trauma, from many things, um, you know, also in the heart, making the heart less confrontative and also like also bringing your mind more embodied because many people live in their heads, in their minds that are not connected to the body and, uh, and the body is still much more connected to that energy of life, you know. So uh, that brings us once again to that topic of embodiment. Mm. Uh, I would say like embodiment is, is really, and healing, it's really the pathway towards towards feeling the meaning of life in, in, in your life versus like something that you, you try too hard to think about it. Yeah, we, we were actually talking about that earlier, about... Um the connection between intellect and the heart. Like as humans, obviously we're gifted. We have the intellect, but really our bodies 
and our hearts. It's like that intelligence surpasses our intellect intellect by far. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I would say, uh, I would say more than surpasses the things like uh, because the mind and has been so privileged in our education and uh, in our culture, you know, it's unbalanced. It's unbalanced. So yes. there's a lot of mental informational knowledge, and um, you know, and only people who are into psychotherapy and growth they start paying attention to the heart and uh, or spiritual practice or the body, you know. But um, for me, there is like uh, it's like everybody, the body, the heart, the instinct, the consciousness, the mind, they, they belong to the same team. And they are equal, equal uh, contributors to holistic knowledge. Each one has one piece, and no piece is more important than the other. The mind is not important than the body. The body is not more important than the heart. The instinct is not more important than the mind. They are all equally important. But the problem is that because we have been educated only mostly into our minds, you know, our minds themselves, they believe and they are the ones that know or the ones that can know. And that's what we call the pride of the mind, you know. Then the, our minds have become proud. And what they need to be is to really become humble and in order to do so, they need to really, uh, uh, really be, you know, open themselves to listen and to learn to the to the heart, to the body, to the instinct, you know, through normally through experiential practices to start kind of like becoming more embodied and like and to really sit in the same table with the body and the heart and the mind and everybody else and, and, and co create knowledge and co create your life, mm-hmm. both your personal life and your spiritual life. Absolutely. I, I'm I'm so grateful for just what you just shared. Yeah, that addition yeah, is like everything. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. It yeah. was such a pleasure. Such a pleasure talking with you guys. Thank you, Jorge. In your eyes, an ocean of sadness resides. A hollow yearning writhes from your chest. Open and let me in, for I speak the ancient language of universal sorrow. I'm a nightly sojourner. And I have seen the monsters of unexpressed grief. Open and let me in. Choose life and I will show you honey that comes from divine heights. You're a nightly sojourner too. Time to gather your armor and fight for the one life you can save. Stop looking for humanly love for it'll deceive you. Another love awaits you. My tongue on your tongue will teach you, soul friends, spread your wings and escape the cage of your limbs. Another type of love awaits you, another type of love awaits you. hope you enjoyed this episode. Next week, we talk to Yakov Lefko about Nadon Inner Alchemy and Sexual Kung Fu. You can find links and show notes at soulspacepodcast.com. Please support us by leaving us a review on iTunes. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Until next time.